No. Okay. You what? Okay. Tom, can you mute everyone? Okay. So I think we're going to wait for a second to let everyone in. Um, and then we're going to start. This is the moment. This is the app that we need to develop. This music, the Zoom <laughs> music that keeps everyone happy until we start talking. Can't you just put any music now? Yes, we can. Okay. Okay, I think we're ready. And uh, you can start. Yep. Mm -hmm. We're going to have people coming in, but it will be okay. Yeah. So um, um, I want to welcome everyone. I'm going to start in Hebrew and then uh, we move back to English. Uh, שמדבר על ה... אולי על השאלות המעניינות ביותר של התחום שלנו כעוצרים ועוצרות לעיצוב וזה יהיה התהליך של המפגש של המוזיאונים עם עיצוב השאלות שנוגעות להצגה של העיצוב, לאיסוף שלו ועבודה עם מוזיאונים אבל כל האירוע הנהדר הזה אני חבה לו תודה גדולה לשני האיגודים אחד איגוד המוזיאונים הישראלי של איקום הישראלי כמו שאנחנו קוראים לו וכמובן למי שהובילה וניצחה למלאכה באופן יוצא דופן פולינה משגרירות ארצות הברית שבלעדיה ובלי הקשר אל מוזיאוני הסמיסיוניון כל האירוע המרגש הזה לא יכול היה לקרות אז אני רוצה להגיד קודם כל תודה רבה לפולינה ולהזמין אותך אם את רוצה לומר כמה מילים ואחר כך נמשיך הלאה תודה רבה רבה גלית תודה רבה גלית ותודה רבה לכל אחד Hi Ellen, hi Michelle, hi Andy, hi Rochas, and uh, welcome to Israel in a way. <laughs> um, and thank you for being here with us. I am very, very excited to be here again with you. As a former museum professional myself, I'm very passionate about this series. I'm very happy about you know, the fact that it is finally happening, albeit by Zoom. Uh, but still happening and still we're hearing amazing, amazing lectures and sessions. Yesterday we had amazing workshop um, and, uh, and it's just really exciting. And uh, I do hope that each and every one of you will be able to take something from this uh, session today and the future sessions as well. And I would like to remind that this is not just, you know, hearing our colleagues from the Smithsonian and uh, our colleagues from other museums. It's actually a cultural exchange. So, and it's a discussion, right, David? It's not mm -hmm. a frontal lecture here. So I encourage you to actively participate, to share your knowledge, your experience, to ask questions, because uh, it's not, uh, we're, we're not doing this only to, you know, enrich your knowledge, but actually, uh, we're doing it to understand and apply and develop some practical tools uh, for this challenging period uh, that we are all experiencing. So I would like to thank you, all our speakers. I would like to thank the leads and Tom and uh, Ecom Israel colleagues. Uh, good luck, enjoy, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Polina. Um, when we started thinking or imagining this uh, session, uh, discussing the future of museums, our challenges and, and hopes for the future of museums, um, and focusing on design museums and design curatorial work at museums, uh, the first name that um, 
I was dreaming of having as a, as a first guest or the main guest for us was Ellen Lupton, a senior curator at the Copa Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum in New York. And I think the last time we've met um, was in London at the Bayano. Um, we were displaying right next to each other, uh, thinking of why do we do what we do and how do we do it? Sometimes it feels like magic. But um, when we started uh, discussing uh, the series of lectures, we uh, divided into three, displaying design, collecting design, and working with designers, which will conclude this whole session. Um, I have to say that uh, I have to say thank you for um, to Alan for this uh, partnership and all the Zoom meetings we had, very happy Zoom meetings, um, thinking about our profession and not taking anything uh, uh, for granted and understanding the um, responsibility that we have as curators working today in museums, introducing everyday life and the everyday work uh, in crossing borders into the incredible work. Uh, for uh, people, by people, um, every day. So I want to invite Anna Lupton to start um, and say thank you. Um, thank one thing, you. One remark, Ellen, we're going to take your questions in the chat. And then after um, reading them, we'll open the microphones for a discussion at the end of the three sessions. Thank you. Great, thank you, Galit. It's such a joy to be here, and I'm so honored to uh, collaborate with you and with the U.S. Um, Embassy in Israel on such an exciting project. And so, what we're going to do is hear from two curators, myself and Michelle Miller Fisher, about curating design, about showing. Uh, useful objects in the very special environment of a museum. And that is a process that involves really thinking about the experience of, of visitors and also how can people actually have an understanding of design objects that they might see in their ordinary life. And they enter a museum and we create an extraordinary space, right, a space outside of, of normal life, to look at things that might look like a teapot or a basket, <laughs> something like that, a chair. It's, it's a very interesting um, challenge. Um, and the third um, speakers will be founders of Isometric Studio, Andy Chen and Wakas Jawade, who are designers. <laughs> And they make this magic happen, this magical transformation from everyday life into the space of a museum where we can encounter these objects and artifacts as a story and as something um, special and different. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about a little context about the, the physicality of the museum experience. And then I will introduce Michelle, who will show you some really fascinating new work that she has produced. And then I'll introduce Andy and Wakaf. So thank you on behalf of Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Institution. We are um, again, very proud to bring many of our curators to this event over the next three months, um, but also some of our most esteemed colleagues and, and collaborators from our museum uh, culture. Um, I'm gonna talk about the idea of the sensory museum um, and the idea that we bring our whole body to the museum, not just our eyeball, not just our visual sense, but our whole body. Um, and this is a, a very famous diagram by Herbert Beyer, who was a graphic designer who attended the Bauhaus and was also a faculty member at the Bauhaus and became one of the great exhibition designers of the 20th century and really created essential theory around exhibition design. And this image is, um, is this icon of the museum visitor or perhaps curator, right? This distinguished gentleman in a suit. Um, and his head has been replaced by this giant eyeball. 
and he is confronted in from every direction by essentially media uh, images and text right these flat panels that are speaking to him almost like screens of course they wouldn't have been screens in 1939 um, and he's even being confronted from below and so we get this sense of this physical creature um, surrounded by three-dimensional space moving through three-dimensional space but also a creature who's like mostly visual right it's mostly about his visual field um, and I think that that's a, a legacy for us all to think about is how do we create visual experiences? Um, let me move my microphone. Maybe you hear me better now. Uh, visual experiences for our visitors, but also an experience for the whole body. And that diagram was created to explain this exhibition that Bayer created with Gropius and, and Maholi Naj in, in 1931 where he actually put into practice this idea of confronting the eye from every direction. Um, and it's an idea that was interpreted by others. Um, this is an exhibition by the independent group in 1953, um, this wonderful space filled with graphics hanging from the ceiling and leaning against the wall and coming in every direction. But here they added something that Herbert Beyer did not have in his gallery, which is places to sit. <laughs> and as we contemplate creating exhibitions in this pandemic era, I think we have you know, more responsibility than ever to create places of rest, and to think of the museum as not just a place of constant reading and doing and absorbing of content, but also a place where you can just kind of stop and think and maybe even look at your phone, right? If you need to do that, <laughs> it's something that we need to do. Um, and so thinking about the sensuality of an exhibition space, I'm always amazed by the work of Lily Reich who created these um, exhibitions hung with fabric that create this softness that take away from the hard physical space of the museum and create a kind of um, tactile atmosphere that affects the light, uh, but that absorbs sound uh, and that we can actually physically touch. Right, it's, it's walls that we can touch and come up against. Um, the, the great Italian architect, Carlo Scarpa was also an extraordinary exhibition design. And this is one of his many designs in which he transformed the architecture of the museum using fabric and creating this kind of indoor tent that softens and blankets the space. Um, and it's really remarkable then to see these old master paintings, you know, supported on these little temporary walls <laughs> inside this room that's become a kind of shroud and this uh, wonderful um, tactile space. And we see contemporary designers uh, wor working in this way and sort of questioning the hardness of the museum. Um, this is a beautiful exhibition about Korean typography and, and letter forms. And the designers chose to print everything on these soft fabrics and to hang them in the space in unexpected ways, rather than just making text panels on foam core with hard light. And that's something I want us all to think about as curators and um, exhibition designers, educators, like, how can we make the museum softer? How can we uh, kind of demonumentalize? Um, this is by Virgil Abloh. And I just love this image of the, the ultimate edifice of Western power, right? The symbol of Western philosophy, architecture, tradition, um, the Greek temple front uh, presented here as this soft drooping draping anti-monumental curtain. Um, so I, I really love those 
um, those ideas and was excited to incorporate them into one of my own exhibitions from 2018 called The Senses Design Beyond Vision, where I had the incredible experience of collaborating with Wendy Joseph of Studio Joseph in New York, incredible architect and uh, exhibition designer, and my colleague Andrea Lips, who will join this forum in September and talk about collecting design. And this was an exhibition where we sought to um, engage all the senses. It's an exhibition about the embodied experience of design. And we, we commissioned many works as well as um, curating you know, practical works that use sensory experience to really engage people more fully than, than just through optic experience. Um, and Studio Joseph created this extraordinary environment with these walls that are transparent and the walls are all woven with thread um, and some of the thread is actually just freestanding, free flowing, which was actually a value engineering <laughs> concept because we couldn't afford to weave all the thread. So some of it was allowed to simply hang and visitors were able to touch it and run their fingers through it and it was walk through it. And it just added this incredible experience um, to an exhibition about sensory delight uh, and, and all our senses. This is one of the commission pieces and it's this beautiful little pavilion hung with these wool snowballs. Uh, and the snowballs have been infused with a scent designed by Christopher Brogius, an incredible independent perfumer. And the scent is um, evocative of the smell of winter and your visitors can pick up the balls and, and touch the balls. And there's a little uh, bell inside. So there's also a sense of the audio. Um, and this was a project by Ruth Meerman where people could touch this 10 foot long wall covered with black synthetic fur, like a giant puppy. And when you ran your fingers over the fur, the sounds of an orchestra were activated and depending on how many people were interacting, it makes different sound. And so it certainly creates a very soft uh, museum experience um, and, and very um, social. Um, and we included practical objects as well, like these kitchen implements uh, designed for people with low vision on the left to be able to cook more independently and safely in their kitchen. Um, and the eating set for people with Alzheimer's using color and form and structure to make it easier for people to uh, feed themselves and see their dishes and see the difference between their food and the dish and have a higher quality of life um, through that experience. And we, the public was able to play with these things in our little test kitchen and, and touch them and experience them. Whoops. We also created this installation with uh, Ronald Riel and Virginia Sanfratello who do incredible work with 3D printing. And they created these 3D printed touch samples made from different materials so that people could experience how uh, the material used in the process actually changes the temperature and experience of, of touching these objects. And then inside those glass globes are objects they 3D printed out of food. So using materials like sugar, and curry and coffee and Earl Grey tea to create these three-dimensional objects that have a smell. And here we were, we were challenged, you know, what, um, we can't really let people touch them. They're incredibly fragile. We can't have people picking them up and holding them up to their face. Um, we needed to create a way that people could smell these objects without damaging <laughs> the objects. Big, big problem always for museums. So they designed these um, display domes, which are hand blown out of glass. And each one has a little opening at the top, kind of a navel that 
um, that, that goes down inside the object and becomes a smell port so that visitors could come up to the globe and smell what was inside the case without physically uh, touching anything. Um, and then we had products like this, which are these beautiful spoons designed to stimulate the mouth while you eat. Uh, and these are one of a kind objects and also things that we couldn't allow the public to touch or put in their mouth. <laughs> Um, so we created a, a display that protected the original uh, pieces, uh, but also allowed people to touch one of them, a special one created by the designer for our exhibition, so that people could at least with their hands experience the, the texture of these objects. Um, so many of you may be thinking, oh no, all this touching and smelling and sniffing. Uh, <laughs> what do we do now in 2021 and beyond? We're now creating museums where people can't touch anything. We have all this fear of touching and contagion. Um, and this is what MoMA looked like in 2019, like an airport or a shopping mall, just swarming with people. And this is what it looked like in um, a recent month, <laughs> where now very few people are allowed to be in the museum at once. And so we're seeing the, the museum for the foreseeable future being a less populated place, a less social place, a less crowded place, and certainly a place where um, touching and sniffing is going to be uh, uh, limited. Um, luckily, you know, I think the age of overzealous cleaning is coming to an end and we don't need to like bomb every public space with uh, hand sanitizer before letting people in. But we definitely have a public and a culture that is more wary of physical contact. Um, and, and wants things to be clean. Um, we've also had a huge change in museums becoming uh, more digital and creating digital experiences for people like this one today, where people from all over the world can experience a talk or a workshop or a curator tour without actually physically coming to the museum. And it's been interesting to see the response of the disability community to this. Uh, many people who are disabled have wanted to have these services for decades. And suddenly now that the able-bodied community <laughs> needs the services, museums are providing them. Um, and I think we really need to look into the future of how we can continue this uh, new level of access, this virtual access, because it does make our, our programs really um, accessible to more people. So Carolyn Lazard is a queer disabled artist in, in New York City. And this is one of their pieces uh, from the Whitney Biennial in 2019 on the right, uh, where visitors could sit and watch TV <laughs> and the TV that they were watching was actually hospital TV. And for people that spend a lot of time in hospitals, there are special, in the US anyway, there's special TV stations just for hospital patients. And this sort of created that activity <laughs> in the Whitney Biennial and, and also provided people a place to sit. Um, and that's something that a lot of disabled artists and designers are asking for. This is a piece by Shannon Finnegan. He says like, why, why aren't there more places to sit in the museum? And so she created this piece um, to highlight that and create rest. And this is an amazing work by Pipilotti Rest, her, her pixel forest installation that consisted of these beds dozens of them and visitors would come in and lie in the bed and look up at the ceiling where there was this beautiful projected video of underwater activity. <laughs> and to me, this was just so revelatory as a different way to experience a museum as really a place of, of rest. 
um, and not of constant movement. Um, or this installation by the Borlaug brothers that, that uses the floor and creates the floor as a kind of new way to experience the, the architecture of the museum as well as the, the artifacts inside. So I'll just, I'll just finish up by um, telling you about a show I'm working on now, which is opening in 2021 about design and epidemics and kind of the, the history of how epidemics have, have prompted huge changes in architecture and how we use cities and, and how we view different communities. Uh, and it's produced in collaboration with Mass Design Group, who is curating the exhibition with us and also designing it. And it's, <laughs> it's a bit of an ordeal, you know, it's um, got a lot of information and hospital equipment and masks and historical information that can be pretty heavy. And so we wanted to create an experience at the end of the exhibition that is truly a place of rest and a place of healing. And it's in the museum's conservatory, which is actually a healthcare space. So inside our museum, which is a mansion um, of Andrew Carnegie, is this beautiful glass space that looks out onto our garden. And, and the idea of even putting um, a conservatory inside a house was about creating the healing opportunity of light and views of nature and making that part of domestic life. Um, and so this extraordinary installation by Sahil and Sartak in New Delhi will transform this space into this kind of, they describe it as a woolly mammoth, these beautiful cushions and stones um, to kind of relax and uh, heal, a place of healing. Um, so I hope some of you will be able to experience that with, with Cooper Hewitt, either in person or virtually <laughs> next year when we open, uh, or next December when we open the exhibition. So, so, so thanks for, um, for listening to that. It's my, my pleasure now to introduce my amazing colleague, Michelle Miller Fisher, who is a, a curator. She comes from Scotland, but she lives and works in the US where she has worked in major universities and, and museums, including the Museum of Modern Art, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Guggenheim, and currently the MFA Boston where she serves as the Warnick Curator of Contemporary Decorative Arts. And her work deals with the intersection of craft and design, and she's interested in how those things relate to people and power. She has co-authored many books, essays, and exhibitions, including Design and Violence, and items is fashion modern. These are amazing projects. And she's going to bring us inside two recent exhibitions that display design in really new ways. So um, welcome, Michelle, and thanks for participating today. Thank you so much, Ellen. Um, it's a tough PowerPoint to follow. I really loved seeing everything that you showed just there. Thank you for having me. Thank you to Gilly, to Tom, to Paulina. Um, and it's really nice to be presenting alongside also Andy and Wakas. Um, I've set a timer next to me because these are projects I'm really passionate about, so I could go on. Um, so I'm going to keep to 15 minutes, but I really look forward to um, chatting in the q and I'm shaving off a lot of details here in terms of what I am presenting. Um, so uh, if there are any questions or specifics that you think I've missed, then I really look forward to being able to get to them when we chat. Um, so uh, Ellen gave me a lovely introduction. I've just I've put some images here um, of exhibitions that I've done, large and small, um, books and other things, um, items at MoMA, um, and this was uh, Designs for Different Futures a couple of years ago at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Um, but I'm actually going to focus on two case studies today, or two projects that I've been working on during the pandemic. Um, 
And while I'll talk about the design of the exhibitions themselves, and I'll talk, of course, about the content of the exhibitions, the main kind of through line in terms of displaying design is how to design around, um, in each case, very specific suboptimal circumstances. Um, and so I start here with this absolutely fantastic project that I've had the joy and honor of um, watching really, it, it's absolutely not mine, um, but participating in a little bit over the last year and a half. So Shelter in Place Gallery, you may have heard of it, but if you haven't and you have the Instagram app, I urge you to take out your phone just now and look up at Shelter in Place Gallery. Um, it's an artist run project by Eben Haynes. He's a Boston based artist. I'm at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. And in March 2020, when everywhere went into lockdown and very specifically every museum and, and gallery um, space closed as well, Eben, who's an artist, a practicing artist in um, Boston, but he also happens to be my colleague. I work with him almost every day. He's an amazing graphic designer in our exhibitions department at the MFA. He was at home like the rest of us. Um, like many folks in the museum sector, he actually got furloughed for five or six months. And so he decided um, very quickly, it happened within a couple of weeks of lockdown. So this began in March, 2020, to pull out a scale model that he'd sort of been messing around with over the last year. And in a conversation with his fiance uh, Delaney, who's also an artist, they decided to set up an exhibition space in their front room. So what you see here is the exterior of it and the interior in here. The scale is um, one foot to one inch, one inch to one foot, I should say the right way around. Um, and it was magic. It was really, really wonderful. He started the Instagram handle and very quickly got a really um, enthusiastic following. Um, and no wonder everyone had uh, did not have the ability to go into physical spaces. And as many you know, larger institutions with much larger resources were floundering, thinking, how do we keep people engaged? How do we serve the populations that we're meant to be serving? Evan created a very rudimentary but very nice website and put out a call specifically to local area artists in Boston and the New England area. And he said, um, are you having a difficult time at the moment? The answer was obviously often yes. Artists were greatly impacted as many other demographics were um, by the pandemic. And he said, well, would you like to submit um, to be able to have an exhibition of your work? Think about what you'd like to make in your wildest dreams, the really large scale stuff that you don't have the money to make and you can make it and if you drop it off on my doorstep I'll show it and so um, it was very safe it was done within um, social distancing conditions um, artists who submitted would be able to drop off or mail in um, the artwork and uh, if you look at the Instagram, uh, Evan was not only creating this space, but sort of created a whole fictitious language around what he was doing. He made fun of the fact that he was doing this with Delaney on his own. And so he'd say things like, we, you know, we're, we're out of art handlers today, but we're making sure that we're still getting the work up on the walls. And so here you can see things under construction. Um, and these are all so beautiful in terms of their craft and design, because everything that you're seeing here is at miniature. I loved this as a curator several months into the pandemic, I was also desperate to be doing something with my job. Um, and although I did have a lot to occupy me still at the museum, I obviously couldn't make exhibitions. Um, and so I said to Eben this time last year in uh, July of 2020, would he allow me to pitch a group show to him? Um, and I said, you're probably really happy that you're not stuck around curators um, at this point in time and you don't have to deal with us, but if you'd let me, could I suggest uh, eight artists I'd love to commission new miniature works from? Uh, and could we do it so that we can sell either the work at the end of it or we can sell a print of this work? The artists can get half of that because a lot of the time they, a lot of their commissions or a lot of their, their upcoming fees had fallen through. Um, a lot of them like Eben had been furloughed or lost their jobs as well. Um, and can half of the proceeds go to fund the Black School, which is a new school opening in um, New Orleans run by Shani Peters um, and focusing on Black art and artists. He said, yes. And so craft schools, art and the ethos of care was born. And I commissioned um, the artist that you can see on the poster here, Mom Forrester, Boston-based, Roberto Lugo, amazing Philly-based ceramicist, Helena Metaferia, fantastic um, artist, cross-media based in New York, Alison Crony Moses, a wood artist based in Boston, Jolie No, who had just graduated from her undergraduate BFA at RISD um, in ceramics, Sam Nye, whose amazing work um, deals with uh, queer 
elder identities. Annabeth Rosen, um, who's the uh, chair of the program at UC Davis, chair of the art program at UC Davis and a fantastic dramatist too. And then Judith Schachter, a glass artist based in Philly. Um, all of them participated, which was extremely kind of them. And so you see here 3D printed ceramics at tiny scale from Jolie, Helena's collage in the background. Um, Alison creates these fantastic woodworks, much, much larger. We actually have one in the MFA's collection, um, but she created this tiny cedar pod that you can fit not just in the palm of your hand, but in the crook of the palm of your hand, it's so small. Um, this piece really blew me away. Judith made this and it's probably like two inches by two inches, but it is stained glass. Um, and she spent uh, hours creating this incredibly intricate um, uh, design that was inspired by the raft of the Medusa. Um, Roberto Lugo, very well known pot. Uh, here in the US and we were able to auction this amazing small ceramic off that's very much in his idiom um, and uh, I then was able to work with Eben who you see here and this is Alison who you see here to actually acquire this work for the MFA's collection and so it went from being in um, Eben's front room to coming into the museum space we actually just put it in part of an exhibition called New Light which opened about uh, three or four weeks ago you can see that Eben tidied up the, the the outside of it a little bit so now it's going to be permanently um, in the museum collection Alison's work is in in the middle just here and it's surrounded by some fantastic 19th century um, uh, ceramics that we have in miniature again and we do actually have quite a wonderful collection of miniatures that my colleague in European decorative arts Courtney Harris has been doing a ton of work on actually over the last couple of years. Um, Della Hirsch created these tiny tiny little vessels to test out his glazes on. Um, he signed each one of them so we think that he regarded them as individual works of art um, but I just loved the opportunity to be able to take something that was incredibly innovative as a way of displaying design um, and make sure that we were able to, to, to find a permanent home for it. Um, I joke with Eben that he's done more contemporary uh, shows because he was doing them at the about a rate of one a week, one artist a week. So he's done more contemporary shows than most museum contemporary departments have done. Um, he's, he's now not just a graphic designer and an artist, but also a curator and a gallery owner. Um, but very profoundly, he created a space for community in, a, in an incredibly thoughtful and in innovative way. He created a space for artists who are Boston based or based in the surrounds to show their work. And I think that's often a charge that many area museums don't always get right. The MFA has really tried, and I know many places have, but supporting a local artist community is an incredibly important thing to do. Um, and he certainly showed us a very particular way to do it. So um, that's been a really joyful project to work on in a very specific way to uh, design around what were not great pandemic circumstances. The second project that I'm going to take the rest of my time to speak about, and um, I really will be shaving off a lot of details here, is Designing Motherhood. This is a project that's been in the works for a lot longer, really since 2015. Um, and then uh, joining forces with my um, dear friend, partner in crime, and also design historian Amber Winnick, who'd been thinking about this very topic for as long as I had, and we found each other and, and um, have not parted since. Designing Motherhood is a project that sort of come to fruition this year. The, the public parts of it are, are now on display. It's a book um, and I have the first copy actually just here. Um, it's coming out in about a month. Um, it is an exhibition. It's actually two of them in Philadelphia. It's a series of public programs and a story banking issue, an oral, oral history initiative too. It's also a design curriculum, but it started out actually as an Instagram. Um, and so you can also see it on Instagram, much like Evan's amazing project if you want to go to Designing Motherhood. Um, in brief, we started this project because when we came up through design history programs, um, when I became a, a young design curator, um, and really just in everyday lives, what we have termed design for the arc of human reproduction um, was everywhere and nowhere. Um, it was something that was absolutely part of our daily lives. And I'll show you some examples of what I mean by design for human reproduction, uh, of the arc of human reproduction in a second. Um, but it was very definitely not in the textbooks that I learned from and then started teaching from. Um, and it wasn't in the collection in which I was working at the time, um, which was MoMA's very storied and wonderful uh, architecture and design collection. So Amber and I decided to start a, uh, an Instagram 
really it was just us trading ideas back and forth, um, trading objects that we found, trading stories or systems that we thought we could be uh, done better. Each of us has a very specific origin story for um, how we came to this particular area of design. Mine was in 2015. I was in love with this particular object. Um, it is a, a 1950s breast pump designed by Ina Egnall, who was a Swedish civil engineer. Um, he was at dinner one evening in the 1950s and he was um, challenged by a friend of his, a gynecologist, to make a better breast pump. Um, and he took on the challenge and he did what no one really had done up until that point in time. He, shock horror, decided to ask actual lactating people what they might need in a breast pump, um, which up until that point hadn't really happened. Breast pumps had been designed usually by men for mostly women. Um, they had been designed often based on data from bovine subjects, so cows. Um, I don't know the lactating person who likes being uh, uh, called a cow or related to a cow. And so this for me was definitely a really interesting design object um, that looked to the populations it was going to serve. He partnered with Sister Maya Kinberg, so it's called the SMB, the Sister Maya Post Pump. Um, he worked with her at the main maternity hospital in Stockholm. And he asked people what they needed. And they said, well, we need something that's portable. We don't have to, we don't want to have to go to it. We want it to come to us. So you see this little handle on the top of it. It's 22 pounds, so it's still very heavy, um, but it was definitely definitely an improvement on some of the technology that was around at the time. They also wanted it to be more ergonomic. So what you don't see here are some of the tubes and pumps and flanges, but those were a definite improvement too. And they also wanted it to be quieter um, because nobody wants to put their breast in something that sounds it's like a meat grinder. Um, and so they uh, were able to create something that actually when you switch this on, it makes the most gentle swishing sound. It's incredibly quiet um, and really beautiful. And so when I was at MoMA, I said, this works as part of the history, um, the canon uh, of MoMA's uh, design sensibility. Machine art was one of the very first, if not the first, uh, design exhibition that was held at the museum in 1934. And it elevated everyday marvels of industrial and technological design, uh, basically to the status of Brancusi sculptures. And so this very clean interior white cube space um, showed airplane propellers and springs and scientific glass beakers. And I said, I know it's anachronistic. This, this was made in the 1950s as a breast pump, but it really wouldn't have been out of place in Alfred Barr and Philip Johnson's rather wonderful exhibition. It also fits in the contemporary humble masterpieces that my mentor at the time, the wonderful Paola Antonelli, who's been the contemporary curator there for about 25 years, has really thought about um, the, the everyday object, as have other design curators too. And so you can see she brought back the um, self-aligning ball bearing that had been in Barr and Johnson's um, uh, machine art exhibition in 1934 and put it together with things like the white t-shirt or the big pen or the um the 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 chopper chop um and called it humble masterpieces and created this sort of paradigm within MoMA's collection that really um uh, spoke to the the objects around us in the everyday sense and so um, I suggested that not only did this fit in within the exhibition history and the collecting history of MoMA, um, but it also made sense because they had a ton of labor saving devices um, in their exhibition, uh, sorry, in their design canon. Um, so if you look at some of the you know, kitchen equipment or even the, the vacuum cleaner from the mid, mid 20th century, um, these are all devices that were created to be able to save people time, often women, much like the breast pump. And so um, I picked the the the, the um, Agnell, but I also said there was this wonderful sort of contemporary trajectory. Um, uh, companies like Medela thinking about uh, the increasing professionalization of women in the workforce and lactating people demanding design that would allow them to do it in the workplace. And then really fantastic hackathons like the Make the Breast Pump Not Suck hackathon at MIT's Media Lab that had happened first in 2014 and again in 2018. Um, I was told no. <laughs> um, I was told the Architecture and Design Committee would not let it fly. And so this is another one of my great loves from um, our research, the tie -way skirt, which um, as a design object, I could spend all day talking about it, but in short, mid-century um, design patented in the 1930s, um, patented by Elsie um, uh, uh, Wolf, who was um, uh, part of the, the uh, Page Boy uh, maternity label developed in Dallas, Texas in the 1930s, developed specifically because she um, 
uh, saw her uh, sister, one of her sisters pregnant and said that she looked like a beach ball in an unmade bed. Um, and so she could design something better for her to wear. So she came up with technology that had been riffed on a, li a little bit before her, certainly there's a, there's a backstory, but the tie waist skirt, um, big tented top over it. Um, and the tie waist just here could be let out. So the pregnant belly could come through the window and your hemline could always remain straight. I was able to get this into the um, items exhibition at MoMA. So it was the first time I was able to put maternity something design um, into a museum uh, space. I had to call it pre maman because I was told that maternity was a little bit of an ugly word. Um, so there's a whole, there's a whole uh, uh, issue even around the vocabulary of this design being taboo. Um, but I was able to find Amber and together we brought together these amazing uh, collection of um, folks who we are now working with. Um, and I want to pick out Maternity Care Coalition in particular. We decided that if no museum was going to take on our project and we really tried, we sent out the book proposal to many different publishers as well. We thought we would have be inundated because we thought this project was so great we thought we'd be inundated with offers um, absolutely nobody got back to us and so we thought we would create it ourselves um, and we found maternity care coalition which um, is an organization in philadelphia who have for the last 40 years been working with um, uh, families and infants to help them access resources from doula care um, and education to um, uh, ways in which they can uh, gain access to basic uh, resources uh, like food and transportation. Um, they have a particularly amazing program called the Mum Mobile, which we think about as systems design, um, where uh, trained advocates go out and visit um, uh, parents to be and new parents in their homes to allow them to have successful pregnancies and to allow them to bond well with their families. Um, a simple intervention like having a doula or a birth advocate with you during your birth can reduce uh, cesarean section rates by 40%, for example. So this is real tangible ways of creating designed community in order to create better birthing outcomes, especially for birthing people of color who in the US are two, three, four, sometimes eight times more likely to suffer um, perinatal um, death or complications. Um, and so this is MCC's home visits today and in the 1980s, and they have been our partners at absolutely every step of the way on this project. So we have a wonderful book that's come out this year year. Um, this is phase one of the exhibition at the Mutter Museum, a whole slew of things that we're talking about in our book uh, table of contents from the mass produced cuddle up blanket, which has a fascinating design uh, back history that I think few people know, um, to the first at home pregnancy test that was designed by graphic designer Meg Crane in 1970, um, to the seminal Our Bodies Ourselves book where people took on this area of design themselves because the medical institutions um, that they were within did not help them, um, to things like the Dalcon shield, which are uh, examples of design that have caused really horrific outcomes um, and gave birth to the reproductive justice movement. Um, so the project has now been featured in lots of places, um, the New York Times, uh, Vogue just yesterday, um, and uh, The Guardian amongst other places. So it's been a project that I've loved to do, a design uh, or thinking about displaying design um, in circumstances that weren't always easy because no one would take on this project, but in the end, um, a really wonderful group of collaborators coming together to make it possible. And I think that hits me just at the 20 minute mark, Ellen, so I'm going to stop just now. Thank you. That was amazing. I'm sure we're gonna have questions for you. <laughs> Some of the resistance that you met in uh, presenting this essential material. So I'm very excited to, to talk more about it. Uh, but first we're going to hear an amazing presentation by Isometric Studio. They are an architecture and design studio in New York City. Designers Andy Chen and Wakas Chuwade dig deep into the content and the mission and the message of their clients. Um, so sometimes we think of a graphic designer or an exhibition designer or architect as simply making a, a box for your stuff um, and then you know putting text on the wall. And we're gonna get more of an experience and an inside story about how that happens and what it contributes to the 
storytelling of an exhibition. Um, I think what really draws together the work of Andy and Wakas is the idea that everything they make is a spatial narrative, whether it's a book or a website or an exhibition or a public space, a, a gathering space, um, they're creating storytelling. Um, one of the projects that they're gonna discuss is their design for an exhibition that just closed at Cooper Hewitt called Contemporary Muslim Fashions. And so I'm really excited now to hear the perspective of these outstanding designers and for them to illuminate the magic <laughs> for us. So welcome, Andy and Wakas. Thank you, Ellen, for that amazing and very generous introduction. We really appreciate it. And we're very excited to be here and to, and to be talking with all of you and uh, Michelle as well. I just wanna say what an inspiring presentation. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and share our screen and get started. Um, we'll show you three projects today, uh, but we wanted to start with an introduction of our studio and who we are. So uh, th this slide tells you a little bit about where Andy's coming from. His parents migrated to the United States um, from Taiwan. And on the right, you can see an image of actually California where he was born and grew up. And meanwhile, I was mostly uh, I was kind of born and mostly raised in Karachi, Pakistan, and came to the United States about 15 years ago to go to college. And Andy and I met as undergraduates at Princeton University. And this is what we looked like back then. And uh, Andy studied sociology and then did a master's in graphic design at RISD. And in his early in his career, he worked uh, alongside, you know, Paula Cher at Pentagram and uh, did a year abroad in London on the Fulbright and started to think about how nonprofits could benefit from the tools of graphic design, how branding and storytelling could be brought uh, to, to the nonprofit work in order to tell more dignified stories through photography and typography. And meanwhile, I was studying architecture all the way through and worked at some really exciting offices uh, such as uh, OMA in Rotterdam and Sana in Tokyo. And, uh, you know, then we decided to work together. The two of us are actually married to each other as well. And this is what our studio space looks like in Brooklyn. And we're a team of seven um, designers and everybody's working remotely currently. And uh, you can see here a list of some of our clients that tend to be museums or educational institutions and also some technology companies. So I'm gonna play a two minute video to just give you a visual sense of the kinds of work that we do. Uh, 
Okay, so the first exhibition project that we wanted to share is the Contemporary Muslim <laughs> And uh, this exhibition actually opened at the De Young Museum in San Francisco, and you're seeing images of that here first. And that was a much bigger space. It was uh, celebrated, it was happening during the Trump administration. So, you know, it was a big kind of moment and, a, and a, ni a very nice gesture by the museum to set it up. And then it traveled to Frankfurt um, and then it was gonna come to New York City. And you can see in this earlier version, the ceilings were very tall and it was a very glamorous exhibit. And when it came to New York, there was a slightly different curatorial stance and a different space, a different um, context. And so we'll show you in a moment how we kind of reorganized this exhibit for New York. Here you can get a sense of the kinds of objects. It was mostly um, mannequins, around 80 of them. And the space was gonna be smaller. And it was actually the same gallery that Ellen shared earlier, the census exhibit, you know. Uh, and uh, we wanted to see how we could share both very elite, um, fashion design by like royal families, for example, or for royal families, as well as um, humble street styles and protest pieces that were critiquing the Islamic culture through fashion. And so we looked at the Cordoba Mosque as an example of like an egalitarian space where it's essentially a, a grid that can be expanded upon. We also were inspired by the idea of the arch. And this is actually a museum in China. It has nothing to do with Muslim culture. But we left that half arches uh, when you move through the space, kind of constantly change your perception and framing of the space. So we really gravitated towards that, as well as the uh, fabric that you see here in an exhibition from the Metropolitan Art Museum. So we're always looking for, um, you know, visual cues and inspiration. In terms of typography, we took the Sao display typeface, which is relatively a contemporary. And we just changed the dot. So it looked like an Arabic dot, like the, the rotated square, because we wanted to kind of hint at Islamic culture, but also wanted to recognize that um, Islam is kind of practiced by beyond just the Arab world, for example. And so you can see here some examples of the artwork that was going to be shown. And even though there's a lot of critique, uh, we also wanted to have an overall sense of celebration because you know the community was very um, kind of excluded during especially during that administration and so you can see here in the space of the of the gallery we had to maintain three foot touch distance and so we created this curvilinear platform and in addition we added uh, these half arches that had fabric and you could put typography on the fabric, you could put type on the walls. And also to distinguish the different regions and categories, we use paint color to subtly differentiate. And you can see here some mock-ups, um, even the labels kind of curve with the platforms and just wanted to make sure that everything, you know, came out really, really good. <laughs> you can see some examples of the, of the type being applied and tested. And then some images of the actual installation and production. And uh, we really wanted the platforms to be seamless, to be floating, and the fabricators at New Project in Brooklyn were able to do all of that. And yeah, so these arches were very delicate and elegant, and they kind of transformed the space, but without taking away from like, um, you know, just the amount of space that was available. And the idea of veiling, of partially showing, are explored. There are mannequins here that, are, that have their heads covered, others who have not. And really, uh, the stance was to celebrate personal choice and whatever people decide to, to wear and to, and to express themselves through fashion. Anything to add? Okay. So yeah, now we're just showing you some images from the, from the exhibit. And uh, complementing the Saul display typeface is the um, Founders Grotesque, which is very legible and also provides kind of a bolder texture to the typography. And we really care about, you know, typesetting and rag, uh, rags, which is the long short, long short of the left aligned typeface. And yeah, it was really wonderful to work with Cooper Hewitt on this project.
so uh, this project, the next project we're going to show is also about the political function of beauty. So this project is for the Rose Art Museum, which was designed recently during the pandemic, just opened last month. And uh, there was actually two exhibits. One is called Recollections, Six Decades um, of the Rose Art Museum. The second one is called Frida Kahlo Pose. It inaugurates uh, the, the new directorship of Ghani Ankhori, who is an Israeli curator and an expert in Frida Kahlo and also in the art uh, of Israel and Palestine. And um, Ghani is uh, a, like a force of nature. And she came in um, to the museum. Her tenure started on January 1st. She contacted us on right before on December 23rd and said, hey, I have four months to put up these two massive 13,000 square foot exhibitions. Are you game for this? And I'm like, okay, sure. And she's like, well, I want to uh, decolonize and, um, and create an anti-racist exhibition that puts uh, the, um, the Rose's uh, collection of contemporary art into context. Uh, so bringing up um, the voices and the personhood of Black and Indigenous and Latinx and Asian artists um, uh, alongside their uh, the more famous artworks by Picasso and um, you know, uh, yeah, Andy Warhol, and et cetera. And then Frida Kahlo, she wanted to do a photography exhibition, an uh, exhibition that primarily focused on um, Frida Kahlo herself as the art object shown in photographs. So the Rose Art Museum has a long history. Essentially, it began as a place to store Mrs. Rose's china. That didn't work for very long. They realized that nobody went to this museum. And so they started to collect um, uh, by, like, artworks by Franz Klein and these kind of people who are really famous now. But then it was just like New York art shows, not very expensive artwork. They had like $10,000 could buy like you know 20 artworks. And uh, then in 2001, they added this Lois Foster wing, which is the large, very large gallery to be able to have monumental art shows. And they've done some really incredible work in these spaces. But Ghani wanted a transformative exhibition uh, that created a sense of place within the galleries um, that was not formally there before. Not necessarily defying the, the, the conventions of art display as that as um, they've been codified um, because she didn't want to violate the artwork, but at the same time she wanted to think about a non-linear experience that was decolonial. So, for example, she would put, you know, the uh, famous painting by by de Kooning next to um, the comparative painting by Robert Colescott, a, a black artist, and then that takes the mammy figure and uses it as as a form of critique. And he would, she would display, for, for example, Sam Gilliam on the left is abstract expressionist black painter on the right um, next to an artwork by Anna Mendieta called Body Tracks, which where she uses her own body as uh, the vehicle of creating the painting and that idea of um, um, violence against women being visualized in a visceral way. Uh, and a large waterfall sculpture by Mark Bradford, a black artist, and next to um, a, a tr uh, artwork about the trans community. I I I so the, uh, the exhibition is going to be called Recollection. Then she added the S to everything because um, she wanted it to be plural. But the idea was uh, it centered around this idea of the colon as a device. Like colon, it, um, it begins a list. It also begins uh, creates analogy between two um, seemingly dissimilar ideas. And then that that the dot of the colon also becomes sort of a circular motif that then repeats. And um, the punctuation itself, like in the work of John Warwicker, becomes a kind of ukiyo-e floating art, uh, and it can um, become a typographic texture that becomes animated throughout the gallery space. And here was some sort of example poster showing the visual system in place. And the Frida Kahlo exhibit uh, um, needed to sort of you know, talk about Frida Kahlo as an art object uh, and a subject in her own right. So here she is painting the two Fridas on the left, the left Frida in the Tijuana dress, um, classical Tijuana dress with her heart exposed. And this was shortly painted before, right, right when she uh, divorced um, uh, Diego Rivera on the right, uh, the contemporary Frida dressed in contemporary dress. And this idea of duality and um, posing you know, for the camera, but also posing in her heart, like uh, who is she? And, and trying to do a queer reading of Frida. So for example, uh, she was posing in photos, even as um, young as seven, uh, her father would pose her in these photos. On the right-hand side, a family photo where she's dressed as a man um, with a cane and the cane signals not only her disability and her way of coping with it, but her own self-fashioning, her ability to turn it into an accessory. And uh, we show sort of Frida as uh, um, in this Nicholas Murray um, photo on the left at the height of her career as um, an object of glamour, but on the right as well, an object uh, um, decomposing on her deathbed. 
So uh, the typography is very simple. The walls had to be gray because they didn't have, want to repaint them for future temporary exhibitions. So they would just like sort of paint, pick, pick a color and then you know uh, the vinyl would go up. <laughs> and the, the typography kind of uses the corners to signal the idea of the frame. Uh, and then we would have this idea of a typography that was like reversed in order to signal the idea of the duality that um, you know, Kahlo experienced. In terms of architectural concepts, we proposed two. And the first one was the idea of a maze or a labyrinth because Gani kept wanting a long linear experience, one that had portals where you could see from one end to the other. And you could see through the exhibit through this porousness, but still get sort of glimpses of different ideas and soft, uh, large sinuous tight curves allowed this softening of the edges. Um, the other idea was these huge tall monumental panels that were 22 feet tall and took up the height of the lowest foster wing. Um, the cases would be inbuilt in them and here's sort of a, a diagram and like most clients can you was like well I want this and this and I want it together so that was the uh the results that um on you would see recollections in the 22 height panels and on the left hand side the temporary exhibit space in those curvilinear walls so here's a floor plan and uh, so this is the first exhibit we designed where we couldn't go on site and supervise because of COVID. And so Ganit would just send us pictures every day of like, here's what's happening so far. Here's some steel structure. Here's some uh, sort of plywood going on the walls. Here's the curved linear walls being constructed. And it was it was really hard because uh, you know, like most designers were control freaks. But Ganit is a, a highly aesthetic. So she would really, really care about getting it exactly right as well. And it was just amazing seeing this come together remotely across Zoom. Um, yeah. And seeing sort of the artwork being installed. She was in his little videos. And uh, she'd get really excited, like, okay, this is gonna be at this height. Okay, that, that sounds good, good. <laughs> and uh, she even sent the typography I was going up, and I would annotate them with like, okay, this S is a little twisted, and then the apostrophes are a little too high, please bring them down. And she did. So it looked really good. <laughs> So as you enter the exhibit, um, you're you encounter this dichroic vinyl, which is like a slow moving artwork. As you walk around it, it changes color as you walk and the sun moves. And it's a really incredible material um, that casts uh, color shadows and fills the stairway with just like this beautiful translucent light. And then you enter the main gallery through the front space in the old building and you, know, you immediately encounter this narrative. It looks like a contemporary art exhibit um, but you also have, we also created custom furniture that uh, welcomes the visitor, for example, a new welcome desk, an area for people to sit, like Ellen just said, which is really important, and lockers for them to be able to store their stuff. And then immediately you see a comparison of Picasso with uh, Beaufort Delaney, a Black queer artist working um, around the same time period, a modernist artist whose work was never really recognized. This art piece has been in the Roses collection since the very beginning, but never shown before. And then here is the riff on de Kooning by Robert Colescott next to an Andy Warhol image of the Mammy. So uh, putting it in comparative perspective with Betty Saar, uh, new artwork um, by a black woman artist um, showing Aunt Jemima with guns. And here um, Marisol by, uh, so Ruth by the artist Marisol, um, one of the first Latinx artists that the Rose collected, and behind that, um, a, a, a projected artwork by Howardina Pindell. In the lower Rose Gallery, as you can descend the stairs, um, a really wonderful artwork by Radcliffe Bailey uh, called Storm at Sea, showing um, the, the migration of slaves from Africa. And then next to it is sort of an image by Nona Faustin. Um, and uh, artwork by Christian Boltonsky about trauma at the Holocaust. Here's a detail of that Storm at Sea artwork, leading to um, the uh, piece by Don Vo, uh, which is a fragment of the Statue of Liberty. And here, uh, um, the, the large, large gallery, the lowest foster wing, these monumental 22 foot panels kind of, you know, are, are imposing and monumental, but at the same time, invite the viewer to kind of um, have a non-linear experience where there's a great vantage from every viewpoint. Typography on the walls, the Warhol. Here, this great pairing of Agnes Martin and, um, and Zilia Sanchez. And then there was these monumental openings that you could see through, so you could see from one gallery into the next. And it was really cool because the typography would curve along the walls. 
the Frida Kahlo space, immediately you see a video um, that captures your, your attention and then you kind of peek into it. The title wall. And then again, it's looking from the Kahlo space back out into recollections. The final self-portrait uh, drawn on uh, her deathbed. Yeah, and it was just incredible as sort of queer designers ourselves being able to explore Kahlo in this context. Okay, so the last project, and I'm gonna move through this one very quickly, is a project we did for Google in New York City in the New York headquarters. And this was actually before the George Floyd um, you know, event and, uh, and the pandemic. This was in early 2019. And they were they wanted to educate their um, community, their uh, engineers, employees on the black experience with police in America because they were doing a related product and they really wanted to get a sense of, you know, what should we know? And so they had been doing this research, which they shared with us. Um, these first few slides I'm showing you, uh, which felt very technical. It felt to us a little pseudoscientific. And in some cases, it felt almost offensive, like putting the onus on the community of like how not to get shot, whereas police, which is supposed to be uh, there to protect everyone, right, um, as a public servant, people shouldn't have to kind of tiptoe around uh, just being like uh, being in a space. So we asked them, what if we travel to three cities and re-meet some of the participants and interview them and photograph them? And so they said, great. And it was Google, so they had the money. So we traveled to Oakland, California, um, Atlanta, Georgia, and Washington, DC. And we met with nine, uh, it was nine, right? Participants uh, from very diverse backgrounds, working in different sectors, homeowners, people living in apartments and so on. And we talked to them and it was very educational for us. We heard things like Laura saying, I would tell the mother of a police officer that a lot of the feelings that she may have about black males being aggressive and being a threat, I would say a lot of that is sensationalized. I would tell her that my sons are human, they're loved, they're smart, they're intelligent, they're gifted. And uh, it was interesting because a lot of the men, when they recounted their experience with police, would use humor as a way to take back some power in a humiliating situation. And uh, even though they had diverse backgrounds, everybody had a common thread of having a negative or, or many negative experiences with the police. So for the exhibit, which was supposed to be in the headquarters, we looked at this amazing um, uh, inspiration, which is the African-American Museum, uh, the National Museum of African-American History and Culture in Washington, DC. And we looked at the idea of the public square, which is a site where of trauma, where slave auctions would have, uh, you know, were held in the United States, but also as a site where the story of the country is kind of rewritten, renegotiated. Here you're seeing a set, uh, uh, image of the set of the musical Hamilton and how graphic design and signage becomes a way to, and the public square becomes a site where we uh, enshrine certain values and reject others. And we looked at typography from the civil rights era and uh, you know just how messaging was being done. And we looked at contemporary type designers like Trey Seals, whose typefaces we eventually used in the exhibit. We presented two options and they chose this one, which was a set of panels that were supported by each other, creating a public community table in the middle where people could then gather and talk about what they had learned as a community. And so the exhibit as a space of shared experience of seeing other people learn alongside, we think is really powerful. And so the policing is, situated within a larger cultural a culture of discrimination um, and then you get the policing and then it ends with coping and so on so it was important to talk about history to talk about uh, the the theory the literary elements and to situate that one encounter with the police as a distillation of all of these things and so you can see this photography, um, the, the, the facts, and also the narrative kind of all coming together and creating an immersive experience that kind of surrounds you and gives people permission to talk about things a little differently, right? Like we're looking at redlining, how people are excluded from housing, or there's a, a big gap in, in wealth and so on. And how do we begin to talk about these things? And here, you know, directly from some of the people that we talked with. So these are direct printed plywood panels. It was all installed in one day and, uh, you know, no physical objects. Um, 
And there are some interactives and projections, but essentially it's a lot of content, a lot of graphic design and uh, just narrative. Yeah, this was a painful project to work on because it's so it's re-traumatizing for us as well that we are not part of the black community. But at the same time, I'm really proud of it. I think that you know being able to tell these stories, having the privilege of being able to you know here create create posters that visualize um, the feelings that people went through, you know, finding a, a vocabulary to distill some of this narrative into emotive visual form. I think, you know, is, if that's not what we're supposed to do, I don't know what is. And then there was a space for personal reflection. And then um, this was kind of the opening event where some of the participants were invited to share their experiences. Thank, Thank you. you. Wow, <laughs> what an incredible set of talks. Thank you. And that was a really profound way to end. I, I appreciate that. Um, I, so I think we're going to, we have a, a little time left, 15 minutes to, to talk. And of course, we'd love to see questions in the chat that Galit can uh, select and Tom uh, select some questions from the group. But I wanted to start by asking a question to each of my peers here on the panel. And my, my first one is for um, Michelle, just to tell us about the negativity that you encountered trying to address maternity and the technologies of maternity in, at MoMA and other places. Yeah, Can you give us a little feeling of that. Sure. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's I, I think it's probably something that many people on this call have experienced. I'm not a mom. Um, uh, maybe I will be at some point in the future, but I was in my mid 30s, early 30s, actually, I joined MoMA at 31. And I looked around me in the department in which I worked and I didn't see any evidence of literally any kind of personal life at all people especially curatorial assistants work there for 15 sometimes 18 or 20 hours a day um, and so you think you would know more about somebody's personal life since you're in close contact with them but um, I actually had a sort of revelation about a year and a bit into being there I was walking down Fifth Avenue to go get my lunch and I bumped into a colleague of mine who is one of the more senior curators and he was holding a six-year-old by the hand looking very, very flustered. And my immediate first thought was, whose child have you stolen? And it was actually <laughs> his kids. He had a six-year-old and I'd never, I'd, I knew the books he'd written. I knew the places that he'd gone to on research. I knew so much about his professional life. I had no idea he had a kid and like a, a living six-year-old kid, like the, the kid had been around for a while. And so I was interested in that divorce between um, the labor you perform at work and the labor that it takes to create a family. Um, and the, the, the notion of reproduction or, or defining family life, however we do it, is um, often hidden, especially in a US workplace. Um, and that, that's a story of design that touches everyone because no one, everyone gets on planet Earth by being born. It's not just a women's issue. It's not just siloed in a specific area of design. It's, a, it's an element of design history that really does touch us all. Um, and then add to that somebody saying, not even like, eh, I don't think it's great design, but hell no. When you bring something, it's like a red rag to a bull and you know you're onto something good when you say, Here's a, an open and shut case, design history. I've, I can write you the acquisition rationale like I would write any other academic document. It's inarguable in terms of the design history I'm presenting. And if that's a hard no, this is worth digging into as to why and why this feels so uncomfortable for people. Um, quite frankly, and we write about this in the book, I think it got so many no's. And I have to say, Paolo was very, very supportive. She said, you should definitely do of something. Course. It's not going to happen here for so many reasons. Um, let's be frank about that, but you should go do it. So she opened her Rolodex. So too did the director of publishing at moment, Chris Hudson. Both of them are amazing. So I wasn't just like sending out emails into the ether. I was sending them to directors of publishing houses, to directors of museums with their, like them in CC saying, this is someone we've worked with, we believe in them, what a great project. Um, and nobody responded. And I think it's because most of those people have never had to figure out how to um, deal with menstruation at work or how to lactate in a workplace or what it feels like to be eight months pregnant and still be in a workplace or what it feels like to come back after a postpartum period. 25% of postpartum people in the US come back after 10 days after giving birth. And to go through those experiences, um, 
most people who are making decisions haven't done that. And so I think it's very easy for those experiences to be written off as designed for somebody else. Whereas, um, you know, the director of the museum, the director of my department, the director of publishing, they probably, because they were born in the 20th century, got wrapped up in a cuddle up blanket. And there's a design history to that. They had a nasal aspirator that helped them breathe during their first seconds. Um, they benefited from lots of the designs that we talk about, which have really fantastic histories that speak to the missions of their museums, diversifying, opening up, expanding the narratives. Um, so yeah these issues are really taboo and lots of love in that. Um, I think there's squeamishness too about that, but the think, ick, you know, bodily fluids and that, you know, snot and blood and milk. Yeah. <laughs> oh I think it's about power. I really think it's about power. I think it like people can get rid of squeamishness in many, many scenarios, but when it comes to talking about something that disrupts the way in which they hold the reins, um, people, that makes them squeamish. So uh -huh. I really, really think it's about a subversion of what we care to think about in depth and what we care to give resources and funding to. Because I still have pitched this exhibition, even at you know, the institution at which I work now. It's been written up more than any other exhibition that's on our roster, including 1A, and I still can't get it on a show. And so I think it really, it, it's it's a very funny paradigm, but it's, it's, it's uh, it is changing too. We're seeing, you know, everything from the New York Times getting a parenting section to the Whitney Biennial showing Heiji Shin's work of babies coming out of um, uh, out of uh, vaginas. And so <laughs> that, um, the tide is turning and I'm just looking forward to more and different types of people being in decision making places because this is but one strand of storytelling through design that deserves a bit more airtime. And, the, and your narrative, I've read your book, of course, and it's just, it's so inclusive and not at all about pushing motherhood as some sainted activity. It's, it's really incredible. Um, Gali, can I go ahead and ask a question to Andy and Wakas too? Of course. Okay. So um, you, you mentioned something very quickly that I think many of us didn't notice. And this is a question really about um, Michelle and I and Galit and others who are clients of design. So you mentioned that when you showed your proposals to the director of the Rose Museum, she picked this and this. So you had two concepts and you know, for you, these are two distinct intellectual creative ideas. And what it seems that all us clients do is we say, mm, I want this part of this idea and this part of that idea. Can you mush them together? So can you just say a little bit, does that annoy you? Um, do you expect it? Are, are you coming to simply build it into your process? <laughs> so I'll go first. Um, I, I, I think, um, Curators, especially, uh, that they I think um, have very expansive imaginations that maybe are bigger than our limited minds as designers. So <laughs> initially, it's always a sh like there's still a little bit of a shock, like oh, okay, I guess these things that look like different things can go together um, in the same space. And but like for us as designers, it is actually exciting at the end because we create th thing, even though it's difficult conceptually for us at the beginning, like how do we formally reconcile these two things, right? How do we make them just uh, like make them feel like they're, they're supposed to belong together in the first place and that they were conceived together? Um, that's always the challenge, but at the same time, it ends up with a synthesis of design that results in something that we could not have imagined by ourselves. So I think that, um, thinking about it as a partnership and particularly with Ganit, who is extremely hands-on and like, she's a control freak, we're control freaks. And we just let, let that be, you know? I, and I thought that was the best thing because I learned, okay, like she's gonna install the art where she's gonna install it and I will just move the label, you know, <laughs> um, depending on where she puts it, you know? And I, Thank you I, it was the first time I felt that way. I'm like, okay, all right. I, we just have to trust her because <laughs> I literally can't go there. So, um, you know, and then she would FaceTime us like, I'm moving it over here. Okay. I'm like, sure, can eat. <laughs> and then we'll move the text somewhere else, you know? And, uh, yeah. 
I'll just add as well, like Andy said, you know, this idea of trust is really important. Um, and having shared values at the outset of the project, like just everybody believing in like, you know, what her vision was, I think, and keeping in mind the bigger, the bigger picture. And not just that on a personal level, we really got to connect because, you know, during the day we would be sending files and feedback and there was a really difficult political situation going on in the evenings we would be checking in on 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 Ganit, like how are you doing personally you know you have family in israel and you have friends in, in the palestinian area so and she was like it's really hard you know it's um people are really scared and so just on that level we connected as human beings which i think helped overall then talk about the project and be a little bit more detached and say hey let's just take a step back and see what's the best for this exhibition and for that particular bringing together of those two architectural concepts we then did six kind of sub options and kind of opened up the rhino mm -hmm. software and kind of uh, moved in there and then uh, the, together decided which one so there's no the button one. that you can push that just smushes the two ideas <laughs> I, I wish I wish there were like some like magic box that you just dump all design into it. And, like, it's all magic. <laughs> it's all magic. Thank you. That's great. So Gali, you want to take over? So I'll, I'm happy to. Um, since th there's one um, one guest that would like to say something, not to ask anything, but I'm going to ask Tom to unmute everyone so you could. Um, um share your thoughts and ideas and while you do that i'm going to thank you uh, for this amazing presentations um I'm, i have to be honest i have like three thousand new ideas uh listening to you i was like writing down different little things that i'd like to uh, explore and um and continue and uh, ask you and maybe see how we can um maybe see what we can do here uh, in, in our design world, in Israel, our museum world, um, this dialogue between designers and, and curators, this, uh, those um, discussions that we have with each other and, and um, about displaying design, which is not an easy uh, thing to do. And it's, I think that a lot of time we find ourselves um, trying to deal with the obvious, uh, saying, okay, but this is a chair, why? Why do you dislike display in a museum? Why can't I sit on this chair and so on and so on? And still we need to find a way to tell a good story. And I'm very happy for this last presentation um, that was all made of stories and text and images of people um, dealing with their life today. And, and your idea, Michelle, about motherhood is, is just an amazing opportunity to use museums and exhibitions to explore those ideas without presenting the right object or the right artwork or having a museum, you know, a right museum exhibition, but really using those spaces as a more um, democratic space for people to share or to meet each other and share ideas or explore new ideas. And while doing it, as, as Alan said, very in a very sensual way and not just reading uh, out labels and uh, dancing this dance of people that when you know when people go in museums they read the label and they go back and try to see if something if it makes sense whatever they read in the label and the artwork they see so this um this whole experience and this new era that we are entering is incredibly interesting um and i'm going to ask shelly to address this uh, the idea that she wanted um, and yeah, Tom would unmute you. And before uh, we uh, you can go unmute there, yourself. Um, okay, good. Yes, Shelly. Um, uh, my name is Shelly Shenav and I'm an anthropologist and a museum researcher and a little bit a curator. Um, first of all, thank you very, very, very much to all of you. I mean, I'm fascinated from uh, this one hour and a half. I'm, I'm so excited from what I've heard. Uh, I wrote uh, two, uh, you can see, <laughs> uh, I wrote a lot. I'm going to Google all uh, the examples that you gave, Ellen. I'm, 
And uh, I learned a lot. And I want to say to uh, Michelle first, um, I don't know whether you know, but Israel is the very uh, um, family-oriented uh, Western country in the world, from the Western country, I'm talking. The rate of percentage of Israel is very, very high, as you know. Uh, and it's amazing to think that you, Michelle, who doesn't have kids yet, is the first who thought about the idea to make an exhibition about motherhood. It, it amazes me. How no one thought about it in Israel, which is what we did. I became a grandmother this year. And when I'm looking at my two daughters, I mean, okay, I think okay, I said. The second one? Uh, the second one, what? Question? Question. Um, the second one uh, that I wanted to say is to. Um, to uh, Andy and Ara, Arak? Wakas. Wakas. Wakas, okay. Um, I was amazed by uh, your exhibition about contemporary Muslim fashions. And um, I'm just going to tell you about uh, my experience. I'm teaching in an MA program in uh, cultural study in uh, in one of the colleges that I'm teaching and it's a multicultural college and we have many Arab students. And it happens that all my class in one class uh, are uh, Arab uh, women. I had only two male uh, this semester and uh, one of the projects that I suggested them uh, in this cultural study is to um, understand and research the coverage, the women coverage. As you know, also Jewish women are going with uh, coverage on their head because of religious, uh, and the varieties are enormous and the same as in the Muslim world, as, as you show. And uh, they made wonderful uh, researches, uh, visual researches and uh, you know, with photos and interviews, and it's amazing. And in the next semester, I will be happy to show your uh, exhibition. So uh, uh, we'll, send you, we'll send the website so you have it. So it will be okay. amazing. And one more thing, if I may, is to give you a great compliment of your exhibition about, about uh, Blacks in America. I think it's very brave, especially nowadays and chapeau as we say and thank you very very much for your uh, kindness and generous and uh, braveness thank and i learned a lot and thank you for all of you and galitu uh, thank, thank you thank you shelly um so to say thank you all, um, then our next uh, meeting is going to be September 1st. Um, and then we continue our discussion about displaying design. No, we're collecting, 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 collecting. It's going to be really collecting cool. Design, yeah. uh, collecting design September 1st. It's going to be really close to our uh, new year. So this is a moment in Jewish tradition where you need to let go of objects. So it's going to be a very interesting moment for us to let go of objects and regrets and open our heart for new objects to collect. Uh, so thank Beautiful. you, Michelle. And thank you, Asymmetric Studio. And thank you very much, Alan, for your generosity and time and all the knowledge you shared with us. Thank you, Polina, for this uh, amazing workshop. Thank you all. See you soon. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Next month. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.